I bring you greetings on behalf of the Central District and uh, myself as well. And I just want to say this is, I'm delighted to be with you. This is a, I, not to use the word wrongly, a fun occasion, a joyful occasion with the installation of a new pastor to recognize what God has done. As a superintendent, once in a while I get invited to a church where there's some difficulties going on. But this is not one of them. And this is a joy to me. It's, uh, it's uh, refreshing to my soul to, uh, have, have you, to be with you in a time like this. I do bring you greetings on behalf of our central district of the Evangelical Free Church. And I want to thank you for your partnership with us in our mission uh, uh, in, in our area of the country. I know you're partners with us because I get from time to time a request. Would you send us your prayer request? We're praying for you. We want to know how to pray for you. And I, I thank you for those reminders that you are praying for us. I also want to remind you that as we are part of a mission, God has really blessed us. I remember when I uh, started on the church planting board years back, we had about 50 churches. Uh, so we were a small number of churches. But over the years, we now have, have grown from 50 to 135 member churches and another 15 church plants in various areas. We've almost tripled in size. And that's uh, because of uh, our people who are behind us in mission and in prayer. I want to thank you for that. I'd like to turn our attention to the word and to a charge that really starts with you as, as people. But to talk about what God has given us from Scripture. And he has given us a couple of things that collectively he would like to say are great. This is something we as a people aspire to. He has given us a great commission. Uh, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. To where make disciples of all people. It's, we refer to it as a great commission because it's, 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 it's large, it's meaningful, it's important. And then we are uh, told that there's a great commandment. And even Jesus referred to this. What is the greatest commandment? It's to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and our neighbor as ourself. That rises to a, a certain level. But how can we as a congregation rise to a certain level? Not individuals here or there, but collectively. And this is where I believe God has called us to become a great community, a model church. Something that collectively we become. To become this kind of a church requires a commitment to great relationships. The text that I've chosen for this morning is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. Just a couple of verses, but I think they talk about what really, how we become collectively great, not individually great, in comparison with one another. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, and I'll be reading from the NIV. Paul writing to the Ephesians says, As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bear with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Live a life worthy of of the calling you have. We're at a time where we talk about the calling of your pastor. And this is, it can, it can be a safe time. You have, Eric has been called to this church. You have called him, you believe God has called him. But there's a calling that is important for you to grap grapple with as well. First of all, as individuals, the Holy Spirit and the message of Jesus, the gospel goes out and we are called to a relationship with Jesus. You can feel it in your heart at times if you responded, but God calls you to himself through Jesus Christ. You're called to a relationship. But that's not enough because once you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, he says, I want to call you to be part of a local church body. This is a visible representation of the body of Christ, where, where Christ inhabits this body collectively. You're called to the church. Then you also, there's another call, and I believe it's to every single one of you. To each one is given a manifestation of the Spirit of God for the common good. You are given spiritual gifts. 
Now, sometimes each of these things sometimes becomes progressive. You, you, you understand your relationship with Christ, you fit into the body, the family of God, and then you start to realize, he has given me a spiritual gift. I may have to figure it out for a while. It may be stewardship, it may be teaching, it may be administration, it may be mercy, but somehow God has called me into this body to use a gift so I can bless this congregation and bless this community. And then, out of the body of Christ, some are called to be pastors. Not everybody's called to be a pastor. Not everybody has that gifting. Gary demonstrated it in this congregation for 35 years. Wow. It's a high mark. You have a new pastor. He has been called, separated out of the body, and in a very unique way, is affirmed through your process as you pick up the torch, as you continue the ministry here. That's why we're here today. Really to recognize Eric's calling, but also to remind you first to live worthy of your calling. So make every effort, the Bible says. What does it start with? Be completely humble. It's not a classic virtue where people say, oh boy, I wish I was humble. You know, I, I, I would like to be known as the humblest person. Uh, we sometimes struggle with that. In one of the well-known philosophers, German philosopher Nietzsche said, humility is to deny who you really are. We have to rise up. We're, we're, we gotta be Superman. We're, we're just individually, we're just, mm. it's not what everybody wants to be known as, but Jesus was known as humble. In fact, some people have bought into Nietzsche's philosophy. Some of you, maybe, hopefully, quite a few of you remember Muhammad Ali. Cassius Clay became Muhammad Ali. He was anything less than humble, for those who remember him. Remember his phrase? I am the greatest. He would say that. I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. And there's the uh, story of him when he was flying in an airplane one time and he refused to put on his seatbelt. And the stewardess came by and said to him, Mr. Ali, you have to put on your seatbelt. And he said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. <laughs> and she looked at him and she said, Superman don't need no airplane. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but humility, the way it's used here is a form of resignation before God. Whatever God says about me, I will believe or I will follow. It's a reminder of who God, we were before God got a hold of us. But this sense of greatness can not just pop up in Muhammad Ali. It can pop up in the church at times when people do comparison and think they're maybe better than someone else. We'd say, well, they certainly wouldn't have been true of the disciples. You know, they were walking with Jesus. But in at least two occasions in Mark and Mark's gospel and Luke's gospel, the, the disciples were, were walking along and talking amongst themselves, and all of a sudden Jesus turns around and say, said, what do you say? Now, it's pretty hard to lie to Jesus, isn't it? Or it should be. And they said, well, we we're talking about who among us is the greatest. We we're doing some comparisons. We we're talking about who's the greatest. <coughs> that is not the mark of a solid, good church. Your calling is humility. I accept all that God says about me without arguing. And you know, this is where it really starts. None of us can, can come into the kingdom uh, at different tiers. All of us come, came in as dead people who were born again. Paul says in earlier in Ephesians, uh, you were dead in your trespasses and sins when you walked in the ways of the prince of the power of the air. All of us were dead and we're walking, following Satan to one degree or another. He's the prince of the power of the air. 
So if you're dead and walking, I, let's put it in today's terminology, you're a zombie, right? We're all zombies until we were born again. We're dead men walking. So nobody comes in suddenly better than anybody else, even if you've been raised in church your whole life. We're Satanists in that sense. But we are on a mission to be thankful. We say, if whatever God says about it, if he says I was dead, this is who I am. If God says something from scripture that gives me direction, that's what I follow. We're living in a community in which there are dead people walking. It doesn't mean they're, they're, they're not walking, but they're not followers of Jesus. And we have, we're on a mission to bring them the gospel. Second, be completely gentle. The God-centered virtue. Webster says gentleness is enduring injury with patience without resentment. Uh, it, it belongs to a class of people and in, the, in the best sense who can be trusted in society. In the classical literature, uh, in, the, in the ancient Greek, it was an animal that has learned to accept the commands and controls of its master. In other words, an animal that can be trusted around others and be useful. Now, back in the days where there, we were more agrarian, people would understand this immediately. I'm, I'm going to have a workhorse. I'm going to have a horse. What's the ho if the horse has not been gentle and can be trusted, you've got a problem. If the animals you're using can't be trusted around other people, you're always going to be on edge. Many of us have pets now that live in our house. Do you want a gentle pet or a wild pet? In church, we're told that we should have this ability of gentility about us that we can be trusted not to hurt and constantly destroy and, and bother other people. It's gentleness. Trusted around others. I accept a definition I found. I accept all of God's dealings with me without bitterness. In other words, we are all going to go through some difficulties at times, sufferings or, 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 or challenges. Joseph was one of the great examples of all of the things that went wrong in his life with his brothers uh, throwing him in a pit, wanting to kill him, throwing him in a pit and saying, instead of killing him, maybe we can make some money. Let's sell him to slave traders. He goes to Egypt. He's put in prison for being honorable. He's still put in prison. But he never became bitter. He was eventually raised to a high level. Eventually, he meets his brothers and family and, and said this, you meant it for evil, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. Not a trace of bitterness. The third thing for us as congregation is to be completely patient. And this is now sort of horizontal, uh, a willingness to wait for events to unfold rather than trying to force them. If we're gonna live up to our calling, with others, we are going to realize that some people will rub us wrong at, at times. Some people will cause friction. But we need to be patient with one another. I, uh, a situation I remember happened to me in, in uh, a church I served in which I encountered a very difficult parishioner. Never happened here. We, you, guys, you guys will... Never let that happen. But I remember the, the, the difficulty and the challenge of saying, Lord, I need to be patient because there's something I don't understand. And as I, I, I pulled back and waited, it was over time I realized that I maybe personally hadn't treated him as well as I should have. He treated me wrongly. But as we began to talk and I began to understand him and I realized that there were many, many difficult challenges in his life, including the death of his son that he is struggling with, who died in Vietnam just as he was, just a day or two before he's supposed to come home. Um, he, he became my best prayer partner. Sometimes as we're patient with people, we begin to realize there's more to the story so as a congregation, if you are going to rise to the level collectively of a great congregation that God wants, be patient with one another. Be patient with your new pastor. 
Pastor, you're here because not everyone has reached perfection yet. <laughs> if the truth be known, no, none of them are. <laughs> but this is our calling, to work with one another and live up to our calling. And be completely forbearing in love or tolerant with one another as we grow. I recall the story of a sign that was posted very prominently on a piece of property. No trespassing allowed. Violators will be prosecuted to the fullest extent to the law. Posted by the Sisters of Mercy. <laughs> but this, this is a call to lay down arms, forbearance, to forbear our arms, the, 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 the bearing of arms. We, we lay them down, we call a truce, we accept de deferred justice. It's a way of, of saying, you know, I accept you in spite of your faults and our differences. Now, it doesn't mean you don't work through difficulties. That's a sign of maturity. You recognize where we're different and where we need to grow both. But I accept you as a brother, as a sister in Christ. You know, we all have a very clear theology. And I think you'd all pass this test. Uh, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone has sinned. It's biblical. That's what God says about us. But as Christians, John says this, if anyone, and he's talking to the, to the family here, if anyone says he is without sin, the truth is not in him. That's why we confess and need to confess before God. But yet, sometimes when one person sees the, the, the slightest flaw in another person, uh, they make it a federal case. I guess that's an old, old phrase. But we are told to be tolerant and forbear with one another in love. It's seeing a shortcoming is not a cause to go in the work. Some of the loneliest people I know are the most judgmental people. I know. Chuck Swindoll, who was a younger pastor, he's always older than me, but he was a younger pastor when I started out. Now he's an older statesman. Some might say, oh, really old statesman. But he, he used to say, we need to remember our ABCs. A, I accept you. B, I believe in you. And C, I care for you. So why are, why are these four things important? Why are we called to live up to them. Uh, I think in, in just very briefly, uh, they were seen by Jesus on the cross. Humility. The Father said the, that the Messiah would be a servant, and Jesus accepted that role humbly in, in Philippians chapter 2. Who being Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider with equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on himself the very nature of a servant. The next three words, he humbled himself. God said, I'm coming, God said to Jesus, the Father said to the Son, you're going into this world, you're going to be a servant. He humbled himself. All of you are called to be servants in this body. Gentleness. Jesus accepted that he would experience death on the cross and he became obedient to death, even death on the cross. And God allowed him to experience that. He said, why have you forsaken me? But he accepted it. Patience. He accepted all what happened to him, including his disciples who were talking about greatness when he himself was the greatest name under, under, under heaven. And his disciples like Peter, who claimed, I'll never deny you. But he was patient and he reinstalled him later, as we read in John. And then forbearance and love, Jesus uh, prayed from the cross, Father, forgive them. I believe Ephesians 4 gives us a blueprint for how collectively, not individually, we become the kind of community that lives up to what God says is your calling. God has called a new pastor to lead you during this chapter of ministry. I do know that you want him to live up to that calling. 
He's called to be a pastor. Right? You want him to live up to this. Whatever that calling is, whatever is in your mind. But let me, let me say this. His ministry will not be successful, as successful as it could be, unless all of you live up to the calling that you have. You are called to live worthy of your calling. I'm going to switch here just a little bit. And that was your charge. Now we're going to switch to Eric. So the spotlight shifts here. If ever any of you want to be a pastor and are called to be a pastor, then you can get singled out in a church service sometime. Our polity is congregational. That means the calling of a local church pastor is the primary responsibility of the local church. You work in harmony with me as a district superintendent. But as Roger said earlier, during your search you prayed You've evaluated, you've asked numerous questions of candidates and references, and ultimately came to the conclusion that Eric, who's standing before, or will be standing before you today, is the man of God's choosing. We'll, we will be laying hands on him and officially installing him with the recognition not only of your church and the Evangelical Free Church. He's your senior pastor. And so the process you've gone through means that you have affirmed him. He is, he is here. Um, and you've affirmed his ability, his qualifications, and, and uh, I trust that you are going to support him uh, and uphold him in ministry by recognizing that he needs your prayers, that his family needs your prayers, and that you yourselves will live up to your calling by communicating with one another, by loving one another, and by having a right relationship. But for Eric, I'm going to charge you from Scripture as Paul charged Timothy with three expectations from 2 Timothy 4. Where Paul said to Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. And that's how he starts the charge. He says, Jesus Christ is present. God is present. And why shouldn't he? This is his church. He's in, this is his visible body, but invisibly Christ is here. He's omnipresent. We often pray for his special sense of revealing his presence. And then Paul says, I give you this charge. The word charge is a military command. When a military officer tells you what to do as a soldier, you do it. You don't say, let's negotiate that, officer. You do what he says. And so these charges have been for all pastors, including myself, be a man of the word. Preach. Preach the word. Preach the gospel message. Make sure that as you receive the word from your commanding officer in heaven, that you preach what he has given us. It's real simple. Not everybody is going to want to hear it. There will be times people will come. Some people may leave. But you're responsible to God to preach the word. But if that was all there was to it, it might not be as hard of a job as Paul tells Timothy. He's, I think he was, is saying next, if I could put a phrase on it, be a man of the people. In other words, don't be just a preacher, be a pastor. Paul says to Timothy, discharge all the duties of your position. And they are many and they are varied. You're a shepherd. You care for people. You deal with people not only from the pulpit, you deal with them in the various parts of this building. You might deal with them in the hospital. You deal with uh, elders and leaders and Sunday school. There are all kinds of ways in which you're a pastor. You become Christ's representative in the flesh walking amongst his people. Be a man of the people. Discharge all the duties of your position. And then third, I think what Paul is saying is be a man with a future in mind. Be a man with perspective. Be a pastor with perspective. Paul is saying, my, my time is about done, to put it in very paraphraseology. My time is about done. I'm about ready to be poured out. I'm going to heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So it's not just earthly success we're looking at. We're looking at leading a flock into the presence of God in heaven. Lead your flock to their heavenly reward. You know, wonderful, great flocks, successful ministry 
is not dependent on the size of the congregation, the size of the building, the size of the budget. None of those things ultimately matter. It's have we lived up to the calling that God has given us? That is what matters. That is what matters. And the people that come together. But Eric, as a student of the Word of God, you've studied these things. You're, you've seen this passage many times. You've memorized sections of the Word. You've been reminded often in this calling process, not only by others, but also by the Lord, of the great significance of being a pastor. And I'm going to call upon you once again, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you remember the importance and the dignity of your calling. You are to be a messenger, a watchman, and a steward of the Lord. You are to teach and to warn. You are to feed and provide for the Lord's family. And you are to seek for Christ's lost sheep in the midst of this fallen world in order that they might find salvation in him forever. Always remember, therefore, how great a treasure is your responsibility in this congregation. These people are the sheep of Christ. He bought them with his shed blood in his ultimate death. This church and the congregation that you have now been called to serve as his bride and his body. And if it happens that an individual member of this body is hurt or hindered because of your clear negligence, you know the significance of that fault. Scripture preaches, uh, speaks directly to intentional, intentional failure on our part. For this reason, do all that you can to bring all those committed to your charge to maturity, knowledge, and fullness in Christ. But be aware, however, that you cannot do this merely on your own. The will and the ability to serve as a minister of the gospel is given by God alone. Therefore, you ought and need to pray earnestly for his Holy Spirit. Consider how studiously you ought to read and learn the scriptures since God's holy gospel is the power of salvation for all who believe. And now that this congregation may understand your mind, your heart and will and all these things, and that the congregation may be reminded of your serious calling, and that the vows you take today may inspire you to your task of ministry, I call upon you to answer clearly a brief number of things which we in the Evangelical Free Church of America, and in the name of God and His Church, shall ask you. So I'm going to ask you to stand where you are. And Eric, do you believe in your heart that you are truly called, according to the will of our Lord Jesus Christ, to serve this congregation? Do you accept that title and the ministry expectations and responsibilities that come along with that calling? If so, say, yes, I believe God has led me to this church. Yes, I believe God has led me to this church. And do you believe that God has spoken in the scriptures, both the Old and New Testaments, through the words of human authors. Do you believe that the Bible is the verbally inspired word of God? Do you believe it is without error in its original writings? Do you believe that the Bible is the complete revelation of God's will for our salvation? Do you believe that the Bible is the ultimate authority by which every realm of human knowledge should be judged? Do you agree that the Bible is to be believed in all that it teaches, obeyed in all that it requires, and trusted in all that it promises? If so, say, yes, I so believe. Yes, I so believe. And will you be diligent to minister the doctrine, ordinances, and the disciplines that the Lord has commanded and that the church has received according to Scripture? Will you be ready to faithfully defend your church? Will you admonish and exhort both publicly and privately both the weak and the strong within your charge as their individual needs may require and as the occasion may be given. If so, say, I will, the Lord being my helper. I will, the Lord being my helper. Will you do your best to pattern your life in accordance with the teachings of Scripture so that you may be a wholesome example to your people? If so, say, I will, the Lord being my helper. I will, the Lord being my helper. As you as a congregation have heard these statements by your pastor of his commitment to these expectations. He is declaring that God has indeed led him to accept this call. In a few moments, we will be gathering around him, laying hands on him and praying. 
And that will be what we call a work that is publicly symbolized by, we call it the imposition of hands. Uh, we will be praying that God will continually fill your new pastor with his wisdom and with his grace and his strength to be a faithful minister of the word of God. And may he thus be enabled to graciously administer the holy ordinances, to preach God's word, and to be a pastor shepherd to your congregation. And Eric, may our almighty God, who has given to you the spiritual ear to discern his pastoral calling to him, and then now to this congregation for this time of your life, will he give you the courage and the will to make a commitment to do all of these things? And may he grant to you the strength and power to perform these commitments, fulfilling in you the work which he has surely begun through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we will, are going to be praying this in the name of our Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask those who have been uh, uh, asked to come forward, uh, some of the leaders of the church, uh, the search committee, the Pastor Gary, and we are going to be laying hands on him. A number will be praying, and then we shall... Uh, have the word of declaration. You can sit down if it's easier. Mm -hmm. to get one yeah. Do you have a number that are selected to pray, or should I just have? Well, as we put our right hand, reach out, reach out our right hand, uh, I believe most or all of you will say something and, or pray, and I will close in prayer. Dear God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have answered our prayers to you and guided us in bringing Eric to us. My prayer for you is from 2 Timothy, verse 4, which says, Preach the Word. Mm. Father, we know that his heart is here and your spirit is here. And we just ask that you bless this man and bless the future of this congregation through him always be looking to you to reach out so we can uh, reach in our in our realm of uh, fear of people we know we just thank you that we can do that here today Father we continue to thank you that you have brought Eric to us and we would ask that you would empower Eric to be the best possible pastor he can be Father we think of uh, Eric as a gift from you in the mm -hmm. preparation yes, of his life in terms of the training and the experience you put him through. And we enter together with him in an adventure that will be our ministry together for you. Father, it's required of a steward that he be found faithful. And you should there to be faithful. All the need to be seen. That he will be faithful to preach the word and to love the people and to be a true shepherd, guiding them into your will and your way. Our Father, we thank you that we can stand on a solid foundation, your word. And we pray that as the years go by, that Eric may see the building on this solid foundation of the word of God. We pray in Jesus' name. And Heavenly Father, as we surround this man, Pastor Eric, we would ask your deepest, richest blessing to rest upon him. Inspire him from his study of scriptures that uh, you have always been present and that your promise was to the end of the age that you will be present and that means throughout church history there have been so many occasions where we have seen your miraculous hand resting upon people, individuals both in congregations and leading congregations that uh, that Eric will never, never doubt that you are with him, that you want to bless this ministry, that you want to guide him in the way he should go. Give him confidence in your word. Give him great love for this congregation. And we ask this blessing in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. 
Amen. Amen. And now it's with great joy that on behalf of the Central District and the Evangelical Free Church of America that we declare Eric Tweetmeyer to be the officially installed senior lead pastor of your congregation. We are so glad you joined us in today's program. We'd like to personally invite you to come visit us sometime. We are conveniently located at the corner of 11th and Main in Cedar Falls. Sunday school is at 9 o'clock. Fellowship time is at 10 o'clock. And the worship service is at 1030. On Wednesday nights, we have Kids Club for grades 1 through 7 and adult Bible study at the same time from 630 to 8. Thank you again and join us again next time for Living by Faith.